Welcome to the webinar. To simplify proceedings, guests are muted during the presentation. Please use the chat box to ask questions, and questions will be answered at the end. Hello and welcome to today's Forensic Science webinar, all about the science of detecting finger marks. My name is Dr. Roberto King, and I'm the Vice President of Product here at Foster & Freeman where my role is primarily to oversee the company's product innovation and development portfolio. My route into forensics took me via a PhD in chemistry, during which time I developed a real interest in the science of finger mark detection and the wide variety of chemical treatments that are used to reveal these crucial fragments of forensic evidence. During today's webinar, we'll be drawing on my understanding of the subject matter and exploring some of the new and emerging methods that are being used to detect finger marks both at the crime scene and within specialist fingerprint laboratories around the world. So let's have a look at what's coming up today. possible to speak about fingerprint forensics without first mentioning the fact that fingerprints have been used to identify individuals for thousands of years. Indeed, the ancient Babylonians and the Chinese both used fingerprints that were pressed into things like clay seals when conducting business transactions, while in the Roman Empire it was commonplace to use a fingerprint as a method of signing documents. More recently, and by that I mean only a hundred or so years ago, Fingerprints actually became a fixture of forensic science when Sir Francis Galton, who is a British scientist and cousin of Charles Darwin, demonstrated that fingerprints are unique to each individual and remain unchanged throughout a person's life. Galton used his research to develop the first fingerprint classification system based on pattern types and is often referred to as the Galton system. Building on the scientific foundations provided by Galton, Another Brit, Sir Edward Henry, of the British Police, introduced a systematic and practical method for fingerprint identification in 1901. This was known as the Henry classification system, and Henry devised a method of categorising fingerprints based on pattern types and ridge characteristics. And this is a system that became widely adopted and formed the basis for fingerprint identification methods used by law enforcement agencies all around the world. In the hundred plus years since Galton and Henry published their work, research and scientific study in the field of fingerprint forensics has continued to provide new methods capable of revealing previously impossible finger marks. This field combines the knowledge of chemistry, of physics, of biology, of mathematics to uncover hidden prints and extract valuable information for criminal investigations. Through the advancements of techniques and technologies, fingerprint detection has evolved from pressing finger marks into clay into a highly sophisticated and precise scientific process. At the very core of finger mark detection lies the fundamental principle that each person possesses a unique set of ridge patterns on their fingertips. And as Galton demonstrated, these ridge patterns are formed primarily by sweat pores and friction ridges and remain consistent throughout a person's life. In fact, forming at about eight to nine weeks during the gestational period. As such, no two individuals share the same fingerprint, making them an invaluable tool for identification purposes. This uniqueness forms the foundation for the science of finger mark detection. So today, fingerprints remain the most widely used means of identification available to forensic examiners. And as such, various methods and techniques have been developed to make the most of this high value evidence. These methods can be broadly classified into physical and chemical techniques. And the science of finger mark detection begins with knowing when and where to use each method. Fingerprint examiners will use a combination of factors to determine which development process to use for visualizing and enhancing latent finger marks. So here in the UK, fingerprint examiners seeking guidance on these matters have for many years turned to the Home Office Finger Mark Visualisation Manual. For those of you who don't have access to that resource, I can summarise by saying that the selection of a specific technique depends on several key considerations. 
So first and foremost, surface type. Surfaces can be classified as porous, such as paper or fabric, or non-porous, such as glass or metal. Certain development methods work better on specific surface types. The age of the print also needs to be considered. Some methods, such as powder dusting or cyanoacrylate fuming, work well on fresh or recently deposited prints. However, for older or aged prints, techniques like ninhydrin or physical developer may be more suitable. We also need to consider environmental conditions. These are factors like humidity, temperature, and the presence of other contaminants or moisture that can potentially affect the visibility and or the stability of the latent finger mark residue. Available resources, equipment and expertise must combine and this is probably the biggest factor as different techniques will require specific equipment, chemicals or specialised training and fingerprint examiners will need to consider the availability of these resources when deciding on the most feasible and the most effective method for the case or the exhibit at hand. Without doubt, one of the most widely used chemical-based fingerprint detection techniques that almost all labs are equipped to perform is that of cyanoacrylate or superglue fuming. This is a suitable technique for use primarily on non-porous surfaces such as glass, metals or plastics. Cyanoacrylate development in its simplest form can take place within any airtight chamber where the cyanoacrylate fumes will react with the moisture and fatty acids in the print to form a white coloured polymer that makes the fingerprint visible. In a basic chamber, results are possible, but they're unreliable. In a professional purpose-built chamber, however, the process becomes refined, repeatable and consistent, and the results can be incredible. Superglue fuming or treatment with cyanoacrylate is a technique that's been used to develop finger marks for decades and the MVC range of cabinets are synonymous with the process. Today what we're going to do is treat some items in the MVC flex and then we will take a look at those items on the DCS as well a little bit later. To start the process I'm going to open the door and then begin to load my evidence into the cabinet. As I am doing this process, I'm going to scan the evidence bags into the software and that way they will appear in the data log. That allows us to actually have a record of what was in each cycle every time that the MVC Flex is used. Now, evidence can be loaded into the cabinet in whichever way you want. The shelving within the cabinet is adaptable and changeable so that hopefully we're able to accommodate a range of different evidence types within this one cabinet type, depending on the evidence that is being processed within that cycle. Treatment with superglue or cyanoacrylate is a three-stage process. Now, the first stage of this is a humidification cycle. So what I'm going to do is top up the water reservoir within the cabinet to make sure that it's at the correct level for treatment to take place. In the next stage of the treatment cycle, the glue placed within the reservoir will be heated and it will turn to a vapour. Now, what's a little bit different about the MVC Flex is that the filters used within the Flex are smart. Now, as a part of this process, we need to weigh how much glue we are using in each run of the cabinet. And so I'm just going to top up my foil dish with some glue and then enter the weight into my cabinet. One of the big steps forward that was released alongside the MVC Flex were our cyanoacrylate validation targets. Now, these have been designed to standardise the process of superglue fuming. 
Now, standard process is normally to place a finger mark on an item, um, a known item within the cabinet. So that might be a piece of foil or maybe a piece of cling film to just check that the cabinet is working as expected. Now, obviously, as many people know, fingerprints can vary so much, not just from donor to donor and not just from day to day, but even from hour to hour. And so what we wanted to do was release something that made this process repeatable and that would be the same every single time. And that is where the validation targets come in. A validation target can simply be placed within the MVC um, whilst treatment is occurring. And there will be a fingerprint that develops within the test box. And this is what shows us that the cabinet is working as expected and developing the fingerprints within the cabinet. Now that everything I need for my treatment cycle is inside the cabinet, I'm going to shut the door. And starting a run can be as simple as selecting a preset from the menu. So for this treatment cycle, I am using Cyano Bloom, and so I'm going to select that from the list. By pressing this preset, the reaction conditions are set up in a way that is optimal for the processing of cyanoacrylate. The humidity will be set at 80% relative humidity and the glue time will be set at 10 minutes. Now, any of these values, the humidity, the dwell time, or the glue time can be changed to suit your needs. And we are also able to offer higher temperatures for glues that have um, a fluorescent dye within the glue. Start a treatment cycle I am just going to press auto and enter my mass of glue. Once I have done that, the cabinet will start an initialization phase and just do some kind of pre-flight checks to check that everything is working as expected. And then it will move on to the three stages of the process. So it will start with a humidifying cycle and it will try to bring the humidity within the cabinet up to the correct value that's been set in the software. So we have set it at 80% relative humidity. And so what the cabinet will do is it will use the tri-point humidity monitoring that we have at different points within the cabinet. And that gives us much more even humidity across the cabinet and it allows us to have um, a slightly more detailed record of the humidity within the cabinet. Once the humidity has been reached, it will then hold the humidity if that has been set. If no hold time has been set, it will move straight on to the glue part of the cycle. Now, the glue will heat up and turn into a vapour. Here we can see the polymerisation process beginning to work its magic as the cyanoacrylate vapours come into contact with the moisture now present in the latent fingerprints. At a molecular level, we're witnessing small molecules, which are called monomers, join together to form long chains called polymers. These solid white coloured polymers are building up along the ridges of the latent finger marks, making them visible and providing some contrast against, against the background. Well, this all really relates to what's going on at the molecular level. We know that when we deposit latent finger marks, we leave behind residues that include certain salts, things like sodium chloride. Now these salts actually dissolve at a certain relative humidity. That's called its deliquescence point, and that's known to be about 78 to 79%. And we know that the polymerization of cyanoacrylate monomers actually occurs in the presence of moisture or water. So if we can get that moisture into the latent finger marks via these salts, then we can initiate that polymerization preferentially along the fingerprint ridges. That's why we, we require and we, we target a relative humidity of approximately 
uh, and that's why we need absolute control of these parameters all around the confines of the MVC or the cyanoacrylate fuming cabinet that is being used. So while cyanoacrylate fuming is a time proven and highly effective technique, the results can often be difficult to visualize. And this is primarily because the polymer residue is white and it can sometimes be quite faint in appearance. So in some cases, depending on the surface you're examining, it may not be possible to, to observe as much ridge detail and photograph the fingerprints in a suitable manner. Fortunately, with cyanoacrylate fuming being such a widely used technique, there are a lot of options for us to explore when it comes to further increasing finger mark visibility and contrast. What we're effectively talking about here is sequential treatments, the process of layering up multiple enhancement techniques as we try to reveal an identifiable fingerprint. In the case of a cyanoacrylate fume fingerprint, we have lots of options available to us. Liquid dyes and dusting powders are both widely used in sequence with cyanoacrylate. But before we apply any further chemical treatments to our piece of evidence, I'm going to start by employing a non-contact, non-destructive method of visualization in the form of the highly effective but widely misunderstood technique of reflective long wave ultraviolet imaging. White surfaces, it can be really, really challenging to see the finger marks at all or it can be really challenging to photograph those marks. Sometimes by tilting at the correct angle in uh, different types of illumination, we're able to see the marks, but again, it can still be really hard to photograph them. Often you end up with hot spots in the image or you can't achieve the contrast that you want. When cyanoacrylate is used as the treatment, we're able to use long wave reflected UV to photograph the finger marks. This is a really, really effective technique when cyanoacrylate is used. Because of how the polymer develops on the surface, it really readily scatters UV light and it can create fantastic contrast between the fingerprint and the background. Now, the important thing on the DCS to note right now is that I have changed the lens. I'm now using a quartz lens and a special UV bandpass filter to ensure that the only light that's going to reach the camera sensor is the UV light that is coming from the 82S just here. So what I'm going to do is illuminate the surface and then use the live mode this time of the camera to get my image in to focus and search for finger marks. Now, what you will notice is that the contrast that's achieved in UV light is completely different to the contrast that we were seeing visibly and is also completely different to what we are visibly seeing on the bottle. When we use UV light on the bottle, this kind of white milk bottle, this white plastic surface is really, really fluorescent. And so it just looks light blue. But when we use reflected UV, we can see that the scatter coming from the finger mark almost makes it look as if the finger mark is fluorescing. And you saw how quick that was. It's a very quick process that allows for high throughput of evidence that's been treated with cyanoacrylate. With regards to software enhancements, for this particular finger mark, there isn't really anything that we need to do besides grayscaling and inverting the image. In this case, it really is as simple as capturing and then performing some very, very simple enhancements. One of the primary applications of reflected UV is finger marks treated with cyanoacrylate, but particularly on quite difficult backgrounds. So in this case, we have a magazine, so a bit more of a semi-porous surface. Um, and visually, the pattern actually really detracts from the mark. It's pretty difficult to see these marks at all on this surface using just white light. 
But by using reflected UV and using a nice, low, oblique angle, the UV scatter is again exaggerated by the finger mark ridges. And we can really nicely, clearly see this mark on the surface now. And again, that was really, really simple. All I had to do was move the camera to get the image into focus and then capture an image. Whilst this mark does have a lot of detail throughout it, what you'll notice is that the background printing is slightly detracting from some areas of the mark, particularly down here. All those printing dots in the background can be a little bit distracting when we are looking at the print. What I'm going to use to remedy this is a tool within the software called FFTs. Now, these can be used to reduce the interference of a regular and repeating pattern. And hopefully what you will notice as I start to remove each of these spots from the diagram is the pattern and the interference from the pattern is actually basically disappearing as we are watching it. If I now zoom in slightly on the image, we can see that the removal of that pattern has made it much easier to follow the ridges through this finger mark without the interference from the pattern detracting from them at all. And that was a very simple process, but for things like printing dots or repetitive lines, it can be really, really effective in enhancing the contrast and the visibility of finger marks. A lot of people, when they think of UV illumination in forensics, they're most likely thinking of UV fluorescence. That is the shining of invisible UV light onto a surface that causes traces of evidence, such as body fluids and fibers, to visibly fluoresce. Reflective UV imaging is an entirely different imaging technique that involves the illumination of a surface with UV light and then using a specific UV sensitive camera equipped with a UV bandpass filter, we observe and photograph only the UV light that is reflected back into the sensor. Many surfaces will actually absorb UV and appear black when viewed using the UV bandpass filter. In contrast, the UV light that hits the finger mark is readily scattered and reflected back to the camera. The technique is highly sensitive and it's capable of creating excellent contrast even on the most challenging of surfaces as you can see in these examples. While reflective UV is a really powerful imaging technique, it remains widely underutilized due to labs either not having the required equipment available or in some cases examiners not having the required training. It's a bit of a generalization, but when it comes to illumination techniques, in our experience, most examiners are more comfortable operating within the visible spectrum, using powerful white light to boost print visibility, or perhaps using narrowband illumination to create contrast and or to generate fluorescence. Foster and Freeman crime lights are widely used by fingerprint examiners to detect marks under wide ranging conditions, both in the lab and at the crime scene. Different wavelengths of light and methods of output, single LED light sources or high power laser illumination, for example, will provide different results under differing circumstances. The only general rule to follow here is to use a wide range of illumination wavelengths, making use of the full forensic spectrum to ensure that nothing gets missed. In the laboratory, we would recommend that examiners use a multi-wavelength light source, such as the Crime Light 8x4, which comes as part of the DCS5 system that I spoke about previously. At the crime scene, examiners can achieve similar results using the Crime Light Auto, a handheld device which includes all of the illumination wavelengths and the optical filters that are required to detect and examine prints using every wavelength from UV through to infrared. Okay, so we've had a demonstration today of imaging finger marks in the laboratory using the DCS-5. But what about if you're at the crime scene? So we've just got a few examples here of dark finger marks, 
uh, super glue treated finger marks in case you use something like the MVC light at your crime scene and we also have some fluorescent finger marks as well. So the first example here is adhesive tape and we have a black powder on the adhesive tape and the, there is text on the tape which is blocking our ability to see the finger marks. Now a lot of dark finger mark treatments that you can use like powders, these will absorb infrared light. So I'm just going to open the arms on our crime light auto and then switch to the infrared light which will automatically adjust to the infrared filter. And here we can see we have our finger marks absorbing the infrared but also the text in the background is reflecting the infrared and is disappearing. Here now we can take some images and then we can do some basic enhancements like grayscaling, inverting and even basic enhancements like brightness, contrast, gamma. Okay, next we have a polymer banknote, a UK polymer banknote. Now this has been treated with a fluorescent dye. If I turn on our blue light source, we can start to see the finger marks fluorescing. Now this has been treated with a dye, but perhaps you might be dealing with naturally contaminated finger marks as well, which fluoresce. And we can see there are multiple finger marks across the surface. And even if I switch to the opposite side, we can still see some nice finger marks appearing across the surface. And once again, it's a really easy capture of our images and into the gallery to do quick enhancements. Okay, so what we have this time is we do have a cyanoacrylate treated finger mark. But this time we're going to use one of our accessories, the oblique light accessory. This is because cyanoacrylate can be essentially a 3D finger mark on the surface. But we're actually going to combine this technique with reflective UV to see if we can see the finger marks. If I just put this on the surface and move it across, we can clearly see plenty of finger mark details, some with very clear ridge definition. The Crime Light Auto and other similar technologies have really opened up new possibilities for forensic examiners by allowing them to detect, examine and photograph without disturbing a greater percentage of fingerprints in situ at the crime scene. And that in turn provides improved results and speeds up the investigation process. Something that is incredibly important to our end users who are facing increased pressure to deliver superior results in a shorter space of time. In recent years, a lot of our research and development focus here at Foster and Freeman has been in the area of speeding up results and increasing evidence throughput without compromising the quality or the integrity of the search for the evidence. One of the hot topics, not just in forensics, but in almost all areas of life right now, is that of artificial intelligence, or AI. And that is something that Foster and Freeman are very much at the forefront of delivering within the field of fingerprint forensics. Our first foray into this area has been with the development of the Amino Acid Rapid Imager, or ARI. This is a unique laboratory device which can dramatically increase the speed and the accuracy of fingerprint visualisation on items of porous and semi-porous evidence. It's uncomplicated, it's fast and it's efficient. The ARRI includes multi-spectral illumination sources and a high resolution visible to IR sensitive camera that's equipped with wavelength specific imaging filters to reveal amino acid developed finger marks on evidence that includes sheets of paper and card. Then, using the unique AI Assist software tool, the system is capable of recognising areas of ridge detail in order to locate the presence and location of finger marks.
a sample of uh, paper which has been treated with DFO. So here we have our ARRI system and it's just a simple case of lifting the lid and placing our evidence onto the glass plate and bringing the lid back down again. Now actually on the front of the ARRI unit we have a touchscreen interface where when we click it it brings up a wheel of different treatment types, different chemical treatment types of porous evidence. And you can simply click on one of these and it will set the light and filter uh, settings on the ARRI that are specific to that reagent. Okay, so let's have a look at the software. So if we go to the top right of the screen here, this is actually all of your controls for the different lighting and filter combinations that you might need for a variety of different treatments. Now below this, we also have a number of presets. So we've actually put in the filter and light combinations that you specifically need for different treatments. And you can navigate through the different treatments and pick simply a preset and it will apply those light source and filter combinations for you. So let's capture our image. Now our really fascinating feature with the ARRI is our AI assisted ridge detection technology. Now it's not designed to replace the examiner, it's designed to help the examiner to find more marks more quickly and more efficiently. And what we can do here is using our image we can simply press generate AI regions and the system is now going to scan for ridge detail for us and it will mark up areas of interest. Okay so you can see it's picked out a number of different areas of interest and we can have this as boxes or we can actually have it as a heat map. Now what we can do as well is, you'll see there's lots of different boxes here, but if we have a full finger mark, we can actually, if we right click and confirm it, that will mark up that area as a specific finger mark. And we can do this all the way around, just confirming all of our areas of interest. And then we can save the confirmed regions to the gallery. The science of finger mark detection plays a crucial role in modern day forensic investigations. And we here at Foster and Freeman are extremely proud to have been involved in developing some of the cutting edge technologies and innovations that have revolutionized the accuracy and the efficiency of fingerprint analysis. Today, through a combination of physical and chemical techniques, Forensic scientists around the world can reveal and analyse latent fingerprints, aiding in suspect identification, linking individuals to crime scenes and providing valuable evidence in courtrooms. The continuous advancements in technology and methodology ensures that fingerprint analysis remains a vital tool in the pursuit of justice. As our understanding of fingerprints deepens and our techniques become more refined, the science of finger mark detection will continue to evolve and it will provide ever improving capabilities for solving crimes and protecting society. And of course, when it comes to product development, we're always open to suggestions and on the lookout for new ideas that can help you meet the challenges that you're facing at the crime scene and in the laboratory on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, today's webinar is just one opportunity for you to engage with us and open up some of these discussion channels. So if you have any questions, suggestions, or any other feedback, now's the time to get typing in the comments box in the bottom corner of your screen as we switch over to our live Q&A session.